So this is Professor Parker, and I want to welcome you to the Audit Math IG Live daily installment. Today we are going to do we're going to do some geometry today, all right? But we need to do some algebra in order to actually do the geometry, all right? So just take a moment if you're tuned in, and just read this word problem. We have a word problem up here on the board, and we need to read it and understand it. Because we can't actually answer the question unless we understand the problem. And what I recommend is that you read the word problem multiple times so that you can fully understand what information you're given and also you, you fully understand what you're being asked to do and what you're being actually asked to find out. So as we read this, it says that one leg of a right triangle that's key, the fact that we're dealing with a right triangle. That should start like clicking for us and we should start thinking about like, well, what formula would I use? What formulas are relevant when we deal with right triangles, all right? One leg of a right triangle is two meters, that lowercase m stands for meter, is two meters longer than the other leg. The length of the hypotenuse is 10 meters, okay? Now, find the length of each leg. So what we want to do is we want to find the length of each leg within this triangle. And of course we know that a triangle is called a triangle because it has three sides, right? It's a right triangle. So think of two of the sides as legs and also think of the third side, which is directly across from the right angle as the hypotenuse, all right? Now, your first step in a question like this is, or at least that I recommend, Everybody might not do this, but I recommend highly to do this. Just draw a picture. Draw a picture so we can visualize what we're working with. You know, people like pictures, and pictures are helpful. That's why, you know, social media sites like Instagram are so popular, because people like pictures. So when you're doing math problems, if you can, draw a picture. It's cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a right triangle. Now, what makes a right triangle a right triangle? We should also remember that. What makes a right triangle a right triangle is that it has one 90 degree angle. It can't have two 90 degree angles or three. It can only have one because all three angles in any triangle have to add up to 180. So if you had two right triangles, I mean, I'm sorry, if you had two right angles and a right angle is 90 degrees, that would be 90 and 90 already. You wouldn't have any room for a third angle. So that lets you know that in a right triangle, you only have one right angle. So let's just draw a random right triangle. So that's our right triangle. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't gotta be a work of art. You don't gotta be bosky out of nobody to draw a right triangle, okay? So you draw a right triangle like that. And then you go back to the question. You say, okay, well, what information am I given about this right triangle? One leg of a right triangle is two meters longer than the other leg. The length of the hypotenuse is 10. So what we also want to do is we want to label and write down information about the values of the sides of the triangle. Hello. The side is back. She's showing off because she just got her hair done. So you know how that is. All right. No, I'm not. Don't believe him. So at any rate, so first we have, let's do it like this. So we have one leg, and then we have, so that's one leg, right? And you kind of want to label the word problem also. You might want to underline things. So you have one leg, I'll be right triangles two meters longer than the other leg, and then you have a hypotenuse. So these are the three sides. You got one leg, the other leg, and the hypotenuse. So we're going to have algebraic expressions or terms to represent each part of this triangle. That should be your second step in any problem like this. So one leg is going to be called something. The other leg is going to be called something else. And the hypotenuse is going to be represented by something else. So we got three things. Now keep this in mind, right? Because this is one of these tricks one of these, these codes, right? 
it's like a cheat code for any word problem. When you see a word, when you're given a word problem and you have an expression or a statement, a sentence, where one thing is compared to something else, for example, one leg of a right triangle is two meters longer than, longer than. So this one leg is longer than the other leg. The second thing they talk about, and always remember this, the second thing they talk about, you don't have to do this, but I think it makes the problems much easier. The second thing they talk about, just call that X. Just call it X. The second thing they talk about in that, in that sentence. So in this sentence, we have one leg of a right triangle. What was the first thing they talked about? One leg. What was the second thing they talked about? Two meters longer than the other leg. So first they talk about one leg. Second, they talk about the other leg. So let the second thing they talk about, let that be X. So I'm going to say the other leg, I'm going to call it X. All right? Now, then we go back and we say, well, what am I going to call the one leg or the, or the first leg? What does the sentence say? It says that one leg of a right triangle is two meters longer than the other leg. So it's two meters longer than X. It's two meters longer, right? So if somebody was at the pool swimming and they was under underwater for 20 seconds and then somebody else was underwater for two seconds longer than them, how long were they underwater, that second person? 24 seconds, right? Because two seconds longer, all you do is add two to the first person's length of time. So 22 plus two will be 24. So we're gonna represent the same idea right here. So the one leg, if it's two meters longer than the other leg, of course we don't know what X is, we don't know the length of the other leg yet, we will find that out. But we represent it as x plus 2. Because if it's longer than, that tells you, it's, that's a giveaway. It's an addition problem. Plus 2. If it is says shorter than, then we would do the opposite. We would do minus 2. Because it's longer than, we're going to do plus 2. So we got x plus 2. All right? So now, our one leg is represented by x plus 2. The other leg is represented by x. The hypotenuse, okay, what's the hypotenuse going to be represented by? The length of the hypotenuse is 10 meters. There's no algebraic expression for that. It's just 10 meters. So we just write a 10. So we got a whole 10 right there, right? Now, if you're wondering, like, what's the purpose of doing all this? Why am I writing down x plus 2 in the place of one leg? Why am I writing x for the other leg? Because we want to create an equation. And once we create an equation, we need to use variables. That's why. That's the purpose. So, now, we have, and then we want to go back, you want to go back to your picture, right? Your diagram, right? So, the hypotenuse. I'm going to start down here. In case you don't know what a hypotenuse is, a hypotenuse is a side only in a right triangle that is directly across from the right angle. This is the right angle. How do I know that that's the right angle? I know that's the right angle because of this little box that's drawn right here. That's the right angle. That means that angle is 90 degrees. So if you broke out a protractor, and if this triangle was drawn correctly with a protractor, I mean, it's not. So this might not actually be a 90 degree angle, but because this symbol is right here, that means that this represents a 90 degree angle. So the hypotenuse is the side of the triangle that's across from the 90 degree angle. So it's not adjacent, right, to the 90 degree angle. It's across from the 90 degree angle. So this side right here, and this is also always going to be the longest side in any right triangle, the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is always going to be the longest side, no matter what. So the hypotenuse is 10, so I can label that. So write a 10 right there. And then I say, okay, well, I got one leg and I got the other leg. So right now you should be wondering, well, which one is the one leg? Which one is the other leg? Because we're dealing with a right triangle, because we're dealing with a right triangle, it doesn't matter which is which. It does not matter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just call this leg X. That'll be the other leg. And I'm going to call this leg X plus 2. All right. Now, we're trying to figure out what the length of each leg is. So the length of this leg and the length of that leg, these two, right? And once I find out what the value of X is, I'll be able to do that. Because once I know what x is, I'll be able to know what x plus 2 is. So, 
dig this. I need a I need a formula. And once I have a formula, then I can use an equation. I can make an equation. So when we deal with right triangles, the first formula that should be coming to mind is probably something called the so-called, well, I call it so-called Pythagorean theorem, right? I say so-called because Pythagoras was a Greek and he went to ancient Kemet, which we call Egypt now, and studied with our ancestors and learned about A squared plus B squared equals C squared. But the Europeans took credit for that and now they call it the Pythagorean theorem. But our ancestors have been using that for thousands of years before that. So that's why I say so-called Pythagorean theorem. But they can call it what they want, as long as we know the truth. So at any rate, I mentioned A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So I'm going to write that down. A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. Now all that means is that one of the legs of this right triangle, squared, plus the other leg in the right triangle, squared, has to be equal to the hypotenuse squared. So the length of this leg multiplied by itself plus the length of this leg multiplied by itself has to be equal to the length of the hypotenuse multiplied by itself. So now what I'm going to do is now I'm going to replace the A and the B and the C with the information we have right here. So my one leg, I'll call that X plus 2. Let's say this is A. Now again, you might be wondering like, well, which one is A and which one is B? Is this A and is this B or is this A and is this B? When we're dealing with the Pythagorean theorem, it doesn't matter which one is A and B. It doesn't matter. The only thing that does matter is which one is C. C has to be the hypotenuse. C can only be the hypotenuse. The C cannot be anything else except for the hypotenuse. It's got to be that. All right, so C has to be 10. But these two, they're interchangeable. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just make A the one leg. So I'm going to have, I'm going to replace the A with X plus 2. So now I got X plus 2. And I got to put it in parentheses because that means that this exponent applies to everything inside the parentheses because A is not just X. A is not just 2. A is the whole thing, X plus 2. Then I write the plus sign. Then I, what is B? That's the other question. Well, if A was X plus 2, as a matter of fact, I should write that. I should say like A equals. A is X plus 2. B is equal to X. And C is equal to 10. So I replace the B with X. So now I got X squared. And then I bring my equal sign down. And then what's C? I already said, C must be the hypotenuse. And you know that the hypotenuse is always the side across from the right angle, or the 90 degree angle. That's 10. How do we know that's 10? Because that information was given to us in the problem. So that's called given information. We don't have to figure that out. That's given to us straight up. So now we replace the C with a 10. So we got equals 10 squared. And now, what do I have to do? I gotta simplify this. I gotta expand, I gotta get rid of these parentheses, and I gotta do something with this x plus two squared, because x plus two squared is really x plus two times x plus two. And then it's plus x squared equals 10 squared. So make sure you understand how this became this, and then how this became this. Again, as a recap, how do we get from this to this? A is this side of this right triangle. A is also equal to x plus 2. So that's why I replaced the A with the x plus 2. And you put it in parentheses to show that this exponent applies to everything inside of parentheses, the x and the 2, not just the 2. All right? Now, this B is, I rewrote the B as x because this side of the triangle is x. So that's our B. I rewrote the C as 10 because C is the hypotenuse and C is also, C is 10, the hypotenuse is 10. Now, how do we get x plus 2 times x plus 2? Because of the exponent. An exponent, just like if I had said 3 squared. 3 squared, all that means is 3 times 3. Because this two, the exponent is 2, so it's 2 threes. So instead of having x plus 2 squared, I have x plus 2 times x plus 2. That's two of them. All right? So now i got to do something called the FOIL method. Right? Well, basically, I use the distributive property to multiply this part out. And then I'm going to try to combine like terms, right? Because we always want to combine like terms. And then I want to solve for x. So again, I have to know how to do algebra. So what I always like to say with my students is geometry is geometry, but don't think of geometry as some very different and exclusive subject or discipline different from algebra. In every geometry, geometry problem, you get to a point where you're not even doing geometry anymore. Once I write this, 
and then I replace A, B, and C with these expressions, the geometry is over. Now I'm back doing Algebra 1 now. So we have to have a solid foundation of algebra in order to actually do geometry. They're not really separate. They're really one and the same. Because you can't do one without the other. So now, FOIL method, right? X times X. That's X to the second power. Because you add the exponents. 1 plus 1 is 2. Then the outers, X times 2. That's 2X. Then the inners, 2 times X. That's 2X. Then the last, 2 times 2. That's 4. So this x plus 2 times x plus 2 is equal to x squared plus 2x plus 2x plus 4. Because really all I did was I did x times this term, which is x squared. x times 2, which is 2x. All you're doing is you're saying x has to be multiplied by both of these. That's how I got x squared and 2x. And then you're saying that this 2 right here has to be multiplied by both of these also. So that's how I got 2x and 4 because 2 times x is 2x, and 2 times 2 is 4. So understand how we get from one step to the next. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I do with this plus x squared? I don't do nothing with it yet. I just write it over again. I bring it down. So I got plus x squared. And what about the equal sign? I write the equal sign. And what about 10 squared? I bring that down. Now, if you want to, we need to simplify 10 squared. So we could change it. We could simplify it right now and just make it 100, or we could leave it as 10 squared, but I'm going to just make it 100 right now because eventually I'm going to have to do that anyway. So now on the left-hand side, what you need to do is, because again, we're trying to solve for x. This is a quadratic, so we got to do a little bit more work. But it's fine, though, because I'm going to show you how to do the work. It's really not difficult. It's just tedious. There's a difference. There's a difference between difficulty and, and tediousness. All right? We want to combine like terms. So you want to look for all the x squares you can find. Anything with the same letter and the same exponent, you want to match them up. So I got an x squared right here, and I got an x squared right here. And then I got a, a 2x right here, and a 2x right here. I want to match these up. And then I have a 4, but the 4 is by itself. Now you might be saying, oh, but it's a 4 right here, and it's 100 over here. They're like terms, right? Technically, yes, 4 and 100 are like terms. But you can't combine like terms unless those terms are on the same side of the equation. This 4 is on the left-hand side of the equation. This 100 is on the right-hand side of the equation. You can't put them together. They're not on the same side of the equation. All right? Eventually, they will be, but just not right now. So I combine the x squared and the x squared. So I got 1x squared plus another x squared. That gives me 2x squared. And then I got 2x and 2x. All together, that gives me 4x. And then I got the plus 4 and I got equals 100. Now, because I want to solve for x, I need to put this in standard form. Standard form meaning I need basically all my stuff, my x's, my constants, everything on the left side of the equal sign. And I need to have a zero on the right side. And then I can factor, right? I can factor, I can use a quadratic formula, I can complete the square. The easiest thing to do in this problem though is gonna be the factor. So that's what I'm gonna do. But I can't factor unless I have a zero on the right side. So that means I need to get rid of this 100. And so I have nothing on the right side. So now this is a positive 100, right? So you have to ask yourself, what's the opposite of a positive 100? A negative 100. So that means you need to subtract 100 from the right side. And since when we do algebra, we deal with balance. Whatever we do on the right side of the equation, we also do on the left side of the equation. Now, here's the thing. If I subtract 100 on this side, you can only combine like terms. I can't subtract 100 from 2x squared. Because the 100 doesn't have an x squared term in it. I can't subtract the 100 from 4x because the 100 doesn't have an x term. But I can subtract the 100 from 4, though. So I write my minus 100 underneath for the 4. So now I'm going to have, that's going to be 0. 4 minus 100. We got to know some arithmetic. 4 take away 100. If you have positive 4 and then you, I don't know, you borrow $100, Right? Well, you want to buy something that costs $100, you want to spend $100, but you only have $4 to your name. You get a person, you buy it from $4, and then what do you do? You just owe them $96. So that means you owe 96 so that's negative 96 These two terms don't change. So I got plus 4x, and I got 2x squared. All right? So now here's my thing. I want to solve for x, so I need to factor x. I need to factor out, no, 
excuse me, I need to factor out this expression, and then that will enable me to solve for x. So I'm running out of space down here, so I'm going to bring it up here. So I got 2x squared plus 4x minus 96 is equal to 0. So the first thing I want to do is look for a greatest common factor. What is the, the biggest number that divides evenly into each of these terms with no remainder? Well, I see a 2 right here. I see a 4 right here. These both have x terms, but the negative 96 does not have an x term. So x is not common, all right? But these are, I, these are all even numbers. So I know that 2 divides into 2, 2 divides into 4, and 2 divides into negative 96. So I'm going to factor out a 2. That's my greatest common factor. So I write 2, and then I write parentheses. you got to have parentheses. Then basically you divide each of these terms by 2. So 2x squared divided by 2. That is x squared. 4x divided by 2. That is positive 2x. Negative 96 divided by 2. What's that? Negative 48. Because, again, a negative divided by a positive gives you a negative. When the signs are different, the quotient is going to be negative. All right? So now, I'm not done, though. I just did that. The fact That's the first part of factoring that I do. I need to factor this trinomial again. Right? I just did that to make my number smaller. I'm going to do something that some people call reverse FOIL. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set up two binomials. I'm going to break this trinomial down into two binomials, right? It's kind of like taking a sandwich and cutting it in half, right? You break it down into two parts. I'm going to do the same thing with this trinomial. I got one set of parentheses and another set of parentheses. Now, here's what I do. Because this is a trinomial, because it's quadratic, what does that mean? That means the biggest exponent is a 2. And because the lead coefficient or the number in front of x squared is not written there, which means that the lead coefficient is a one, right? It's like what's understood don't need to be said. We know that x squared is really one x squared, but we don't have to call it one x squared. We just know that, all right? I can factor it this way. What I do is I look for, basically I take the square root of x squared, which is x, all right? I'm gonna need four terms, I forgot to say this part. I'm gonna need four terms all together. So now we get to the part where this, this type of factor is like a puzzle, right? I got to figure out what should go here, 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 and here, all right? Now, I can fill in two of these spaces right away because I know that the square root of x squared is just x. I know x times x is x squared, so I'm going to throw an x right here and an x right here. Now what I got to do is I got to figure out what two numbers go right here and right here. Now, reverse FOIL method. I need to ask myself, what two factors of negative 48 also add up to positive 2? Those will be the two numbers, I call them my magic numbers, that are going to go right here and right here. And then this will be completely factored out and we'll almost be finished our problem. So, think about it. Can I say 48 and 1? Or really, that's a negative. So, negative 48 and 1, those are factors, but do those add up to positive 2? No. So, that's not good. What about negative 24 and 2? Do those add up to positive 2? No. Cross those off the list. What about negative 16 and 3? Those are factors of negative 48, but do they add up to positive 2? No. What about negative 12 and 4? What, are, what does negative 12 and 4 add up to? Negative 8, right? Not positive 2. So cross those out. What about negative 8 and 6? What does negative 8 and 6 add up to? Ask yourself that. Now, all of these were factors of negative 48, but what you're looking for are two factors that satisfy two, two conditions. They got to be factors, and they also have to add up to this middle number, this 2. I crossed all these out because none of those add up to positive 2. What about negative 8 and 6? What is negative 8 plus 6? Negative 8 plus 6 doesn't add up to positive 2 either. But what does it add up to? It adds up to negative 2. Now, here's the trick. Whenever that happens, when you get the right number with the wrong sign, all that tells you is that you got the right numbers. You just need to switch the signs around. So what would it be if, because doesn't positive 8 times negative 6 also equal negative 48? They do. 
But what's positive 8 plus negative 6? Positive 2. And isn't that a positive 2? It is. So these are our two magic numbers. Now what do I do with my magic numbers? I write them in these spaces. So I got a positive 8. So that means I write a plus 8. And I got a negative 6. So I write a minus 6. Now you might be wondering, does it matter? Do I have to put the 8 there and the negative 6 there? No, you don't. If you wanted to, since multiplication is commutative and the order don't matter, just like 2 times 3 is 6, what's 3 times 2 though? It's still 6. The order doesn't matter. If you wanted to, you could have put minus 6 right here and plus 8 right here. It wouldn't make a difference. You'll still be correct. So now, I wanted to factor this out to this point so that way I have linear expressions that I can, where I can set them up as linear equations. So now I've really got three factors. I got 2, I got x plus 8, and I got x minus 6. So I'm going to set up three separate equations to find out what x is equal to. So now I got 2 equals 0. Now I already know that that's incorrect because 2 doesn't equal 0. Having $2 is not the same thing as having $0. So this doesn't count. All right, we can disregard the 2. But we can create an equation from x plus 8. That equals 0. And then x minus 6. That equals 0. Now, if x plus 8 equals 0, what we're going to do is we want to isolate x by itself. So what you, what you do is you subtract 8 on both sides. So that gives you x equals negative 8. And then over here, you got... You want to isolate x again in a separate equation. So the opposite of subtracting 6 is adding 6. So we're going to add 6 on the left and add 6 on the right. So we'll have x equals 6, right? Now, what was, what was our goal? Find the length of each leg. In order to find the length of each leg, we need to solve for x. So you should be thinking, okay, but you got two different answers for x. So how do I know which is the answer? This is how you know. Remember, this is a real-life situation based on a triangle. Now ask yourself, how could the length of this side, because we're saying, if you're saying x is equal to negative 8, then that would also mean that the length of this side of the triangle, this leg, is negative 8 meters. How can the length of a triangle side be negative anything? It can't. So what that tells you is, we can disregard this answer right here, leaving us with x equals 6. So x equals 6 is the, true, is the true value of x. So now we go back here, go back to our original setup, where we had one leg equals x plus 2, the other leg is x, and the hypotenuse was 10. So then I say, okay, the other leg, that's 6. Well, really 6 meters. You should write your, your, your units. So we got 6 meters. And then if, But if the other leg is 6, and then what did it say from the beginning? From the beginning it said that one leg is 2 meters longer than the other leg. And I just told you that the other leg is 6 meters. So the one leg is going to be 6 plus 2. So that means that that's got to be 8 meters. Now, I'm just telling you answers based on the work that I did. But how do you know that the work is correct? How do you know that I did it right? Again, we go back to the so-called Pythagorean theorem. If this is a right triangle, which it is, because it has a right angle, and it's got these two legs and a hypotenuse, then the Pythagorean theorem should hold true based on these numbers that we have. What does that mean? That means that if this is B, so if A is actually 8, and B is actually 6, and C is 10, then that would mean that 8 squared, because that says A squared, plus 6 squared, because B is 6, and that's a B right there, should actually equal 10 squared. Now the question for you is, is that true? Does that actually, does that actually work out? What is 8 squared? Or what is 8 times 8? That's 64. What's 6 times 6? Or 6 squared? That's 36. What's 10 squared? 10 times 10, which is 100. What is 64 plus 36? 100. And what is 100? 100. And does 100 equal 100? It does. So this is proof that our answer is correct. And after all that work, we are finally finished. So this is just a little bit of geometry, but understand, geometry also requires that you have an understanding of how to solve algebraic equations. 
and also how to do well really how to do a whole lot of things you need to know how to expand expressions you need to know how to combine like terms you need to know how to factor taking out a greatest con a gcf you need to know how to factor quadratic trinomials using reverse foil method it's just a lot of things that you need to know how to do all right and the only thing to really learn how to do them is just to do a lot of problems like this like on your own right um in order to just develop your skill set so so yeah and the word problems like people a lot of people see word problems like this and automatically get it become intimidated and they just want to give up but if you practice a lot of these types of problems whenever you see them you'll know what to do and then they won't be as intimidating it's really just like with anything in life if you have a lot of practice at it then you'll be straight you'll know how to do it when you see it and you'll know what to expect and you'll have that confidence. So then once you have that confidence, you won't have that anxiety. That anxiety won't creep up and take over. Then you won't just want to put your pencil down and give up. You understand? So that's today's lesson for today. Um, thanks for tuning in. I hope you learned something. And again, I'll be back next week, Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Doing these IG Live videos. Send in your questions to the uh, All This Math IG Live or All This Math DM. Any questions that you would like to see worked out. Thanks for tuning in. Peace.